So to overcome this problem with the ideal block cipher, Feist will come up with some generic structure of ciphers. And it's used in the one that will go through DES. So it's, it's not a specific cipher, it's the way to design ciphers, the Feistel structure. And it, the approach is combining, as I said before, combining operations that substitute some characters with others and other operations that rearrange characters, transposition operations. And doing multiple iterations. Substitute, transposition, then repeat. Substitute, transposi transposition, and so on. We saw this advantage of doing multiple iterations when we looked at the rows-columns example. When we encrypt once with rows-columns, we could see some structure in the output arrangement of letters. When we encrypt it again, that ciphertext using a rows column, it looks more random in the output. So by repeating the operations, it uh, can improve. Of course, if you repeat the operations too, too often, your performance goes down because it, each operation takes time to implement or to, to execute. So that's the basic concept. We'll see in the next slides the, uh, the well, let's see now the structure and not so clear here and in fact you do not need to remember this we'll see that we'll see the structure with an example it's a way to design ciphers uh, on the left hand side here is the encryption and the decryption is on the right where we go up the idea is we take an input plain text at the top when we encrypt we split it into two halves so we take our block of n bits and split it into two halves and we operate on a half of the plain text at a time. We operate on the right half. We apply some function f using a key. So we have a key as an input, but in fact we have multiple keys as an input. We're going to apply operations and repeat them. We'll call them rounds. We do one round, and then another round, and another round. And each round we'll use a different key. So we have what's called round keys. And we see here K1, K2, and this example up to round 16, K16. In fact, the users do not have multiple keys. The user selects one key and generates round keys from that one key. We have one key as input. We'll have some algorithm such that we can calculate 16 different keys. They are called the round keys K1 through to K16 in this example. In each round, we take the right half, apply some function and that's where we'll do our substitution and use the key as an input and the result we XOR with the left half and then the original right half becomes the left half and the output here becomes the right half and we do it all again. We apply the same function with a new round key XOR, swap the halves and keep going until the end we do a final swap and we get our ciphertext so the swapping of the halves is doing a transposition it's rearranging the, the characters and it's having uh, it means we're applying some substitution which is in the, the function on different sets of bits each time we'll see this more clearly when we go through DES. Importantly, the decryption is just the inverse or the opposite. We take ciphertext and we apply the same <coughs> operations, the same approach. Left half, right half, apply the same function, XOR, and do it in rounds. In the decryption, we use the same code as we use for encryption. We use the same operations. We, of course, have a different input. In the encryption, we have plain text. In the decryption, ciphertext. We have the keys, the same keys in decryption as in the encryption, but we use them in the opposite order. Here we use K1, K2 through to K16. In the decryption, we use K16 first, and then K15, and then finally K1 at the end. The, the practical consequence here is that if you implement the encryption 
your decryption is already implemented. You just need one implementation because it's the same code for encryption and de decryption. So that makes uh, the practical implementation easier. The piece of hardware that does the encryption also does decryption. It's just the inputs vary. So that's useful for ciphers because it cuts down on the cost and, and the memory requirements for encryption, uh, for the implementing, implementing the algorithm. But let's see some examples. What have I skipped? Ah, diffusion and confusion. The Faisal structure is applied in many ciphers today, so it's a way to design ciphers. It's not a specific cipher itself. We split the plain text into halves. We have round keys or sub keys, which are generated from the original key. We have some round function, some function or operation. We do substitutions using an XOR and permutations by, or transpositions by rearranging the halves. It applies the concepts of diffusion and confusion, which are important in ciphers. The person who came up with these, a description of these concepts, you know him. You know him from ITS 323, Shannon. Remember the Shannon capacity? Shannon was a guy who came up with a lot of mathematics about data communications, how fast we can send data. Shannon capacity. And he also did a lot of things on cryptography. There's similar concepts. It's about manipulating information, manipulating bits. So he was quite famous both for cryptography and data communications. And he described diffusion and confusion in the concepts. They're reasonably simple. Diffusion is this concept of, in the plain text, there's some statistical characteristics. I always use the example, in typical English language, you count the number of letters, approximately 12% will be the letter E, because the letter E is the most frequently used in English words. That's some statistical nature of the plain text. That's always there. Diffusion is about reducing that in the ciphertext. That's the idea. If there's some statistical characteristics of, of the plain text, diffusion re reduces those statistical characteristics in the ciphertext, such that, for example, in the ciphertext, there are just as many E's as there are F's, as there are the letter X, and so on. We, there are no, in the ciphertext, one letter does not occur, occur more frequently than another letter. That's the idea. The truly random uh, distribution of letters in the ciphertext. An example is that, w or one way for diffusion is that we have one letter in the plain text impacts upon multiple letters in the ciphertext. In some of our classical ciphers we saw that's not the case. We saw we encrypt with a, a monoalphabetic cipher, we encrypt the letter A in the plain text and we get some letter Q in the cipher text. This letter on the input only impacts upon one letter on the output. One way to achieve diffusion, to reduce the, st the statistics in the cipher text, is to have an algorithm so that one plain text letter changes many ciphertext letters. So if I change, let's say a let maybe a different example. My plain text was hello. And let's say I get using one cipher some ciphertext Q S B X C. Okay. I don't care what the cipher is, but I have some plain text, I get some cipher text. Let's take another plain text, different, different by one letter. Changing that one letter, if that gives us Q, S, B, X, uh, T, for example, our algorithm, this one letter changes just one letter in the cipher text. That's bad from the diffusion perspective. What we'd like 
is changing one letter in the plain text to produce many changes in the ciphertext. For example, changing from hello to hells, changing one letter, changes multiple letters in the ciphertext. That's diffusion. And that's desirable because it spreads out the statistics of the ciphertext. How do you do that? How do you achieve diffusion? One way is to repeatedly do a transposition, rearrange letters, and then apply some function to, uh, on, on those letters. We'll see the example of the function in DES. So, and then do that again. Rearrange the letters on the, so take the letters on the input, rearrange them, apply some substitution function, then do it again. Take those, the output letters, rearrange them, some substitution function and so on, keep repeating that. And the idea is then by changing one letter on the input, multiple letters on the output will change. So diffusion is to get rid of the statistics in the ciphertext. Another concept, confusion. Make the relationship between the ciphertext and the key very complex. Remember, if we have the ciphertext, one thing is to find the plaintext. Given the ciphertext, the attacker or malicious user wants to find the plaintext. With diffusion, we make that hard. Because if we have diffusion, there are no statistics in the ciphertext. So just by looking at the ciphertext, it should be hard to find the plaintext. But what if there's some relationship between the ciphertext and the key? Then what the attacker could do is look at the ciphertext and find the key. That would be bad. Confusion is making this relationship between the key and the ciphertext very complex, such that the attacker, if they know the ciphertext, they cannot derive the key. Even if they can see some statistical characteristics in the ciphertext, even if diffusion is not uh, perfect, it still should be hard to find the key. That's the idea. Uh, one way to do that, and we'll see the Faisal structure and DES, applies a, a, a complex substitution algorithm. You replace some characters with other characters. And uh, we'll see an example of why a non-linear and complex substitution algorithm is useful. So, in summary, diffusion, remove the statistical characteristics from the plaintext when we get the ciphertext, remove or reduce the, the characteristics. Confusion, make it a complex relationship between ciphertext and key, other concepts. As I've said, the Feistel structure is a design, how to design ciphers. It's not a specific cipher. So there are many parameters unspecified. So you can get a cipher by setting those parameters. So how big should the block be? Feistel structure doesn't tell us how big the block should be, but people have come up with reasonable values. For example, it can be typical values include 64 bits, maybe 128 bits. The larger the block size in the Faisal structure, the more diffusion is present. The key size. First, a key should be large enough such that a brute force attack is not possible. Remember brute force, try all keys. 128 bits is large enough because going back to some of our earlier slides, 128 bits, 2 to the power of 128 combinations, even with the fastest computers, not possible to break in our lifetime. So make it large enough so there's no brute force attack. And also, with the Feistel structure, the larger the values, the more confusion present. How many times do we repeat the operations? The more times you repeat, the better, or the more secure the ciphertext. So the more rounds, the better. A typical value is 16. We will see that's a common value used. 
but the more rounds, the slower your encryption will take. Because every round takes some time to perform. And if you keep repeating that, it increases the time to encrypt your data. In each round, we need to generate subkeys or round keys. How do we do that? Well, we need a complex algorithm for doing that. In each round, we apply some function f. What is it? Well, we'll see an example. It should be complex. A key point or a key trade-off we see, and we see that in all of this course, is the trade-off between security and performance. To get a more secure ciphertext, we use a larger block size, a larger key, more rounds. But making e each of these values larger leads to poorer performance in our implementation. More rounds means more time to encrypt. Larger keys, larger to distribute, again longer to encrypt, and larger block sizes normally longer to encrypt. So that's a key trade-off with security. We either get very, very good security, very hard to find the plain text, but at the expense of it takes longer to encrypt. And in practice, that's, that's important. We need to uh, consider practical implementations, not just uh, security. We'll not go through the example. What we'll do is use the data encryption standard as an example. So the FISAL structure has been used. The people who des designed the data encryption standard followed the FISAL structure to design uh, how this specific cipher works. DES, it's a symmetric block cipher. So it's a block cipher, not a stream cipher. Symmetric, what does that mean? What's a symmetric block cipher? A symmetric cipher. same keys. The, the person who encrypts has the key. To decrypt you need the same key. There's just one key, both sides use the same key. Later, after the midterm, we'll see an asymmetric cryptography. An alternative. In DES, there are 64 bit, it's a 64 bit block. So there's 64 bit input plain text, 64 bit output ciphertext. And the key length, the effective key length is 56 bits. In fact, the key is 64 bits. It's just that eight of those bits are used for a parity check. They're not used for the encryption. So effectively, the key from security perspective is 56 bits. But the key that you must choose as a user is 64 bits. But you don't use eight of them in the algorithm. It's one of the most used ciphers in the world. It was developed by uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, so the US organization that creates standards there. Uh, and they've created many security standards. It was actually designed by IBM. They come up with a cipher. It was called Lucifer. And NSA had an input on that. And it was eventually standardized by NIST, so using the IBM design. And the principles that are in DES have been used in other ciphers. So even though DES is not recommended for use today, we'll see why, but it's used, still used, or the principles in other ciphers, like triple DES and IDEA. With a 64-bit cipher, we cannot go through examples on the board, because I cannot write 64 bits down and, and show you all the operations and go through 16 rounds. So to demonstrate some of the concepts and some of the algorithms used in DES, we're going to use what's called simplified DES. It's a cipher that uses the same concepts as the real DES, but it's just smaller. Instead of 64 bits, we have a smaller block size, smaller key. Everything's shrunk. It's only used for teaching. Okay? It's not secure. It's only used to demonstrate the concepts of DES. You cannot go and implement, or you, no one uses simplified DES to encrypt data. We just use it to, 
demonstrate how DES works. So from now on, or for the next few slides, I'm going to demonstrate DES using simplified DES. So we'll go through the algorithm of simplified DES and then at the end we'll come back and compare that to the real DES. And you'll see how close they are. And with simplified DES I'll go through an example. So real DES, 64-bit input, 56-bit key. Simplified DES, 8-bit input, 8-bit plain text, 8-bit output, 10-bit key. Of course, subject to brute force attack. 10 bits is, is easy, a thousand possible keys. But it's just for teaching. It's just so I can do some examples on the board. And just two rounds. Instead of the 16 rounds that DES has, it just has two rounds. In this, to, to, we'll see that we need to generate subkeys in this case. So we, we have a key of 10 bits. Uh, we'll see when we compare back to the exact values that DES uses, the, the correspondence. It's, the values are chosen so that we can um, apply all the operations of DES, but just use smaller values. Let's go through it. The example I'm going to go through, I'll go through on the board. I think you have it somewhere uh, in your handouts. Let's hope so. Hopefully at the end of the DES lecture notes. Uh, maybe not. Anywhere at the end of the handouts? No? Okay, if you don't have it, then in fact it looks like you don't have it. It's on the website. I will, uh, I'll put it in the copy center. It's just a single page. Um, so if, I, if you miss something on what I go through on the board, then you, you've, you'll get it there. Uh, we're going to encrypt some data with simplified depths just to demonstrate the steps. This is the algorithm for simplified deaths. And here's the encryption. Focus on the encryption first. These steps. It's a block diagram. We take as an input 8 bits of plain text. We're going to apply some operation. And in this case, IP stands for not the internet protocol, but initial permutation. A permutation is a rearrangement, a transposition. Described, so initial permutation what it is. So we're going to rearrange the, the 8 bits in the initial step. And then we're going to uh, perform our round operation. So we have two rounds. One, two. We're going to apply some function. That function will take as an input a key, K1. Then as the output, we're going to swap the halves. SW, swap or switch the halves. We're going to have two halves and just move them to the other side. And then we'll apply the same function, f of k, but use a different key, k2. Then we'll take the output and do the inverse of the original initial per permutation, ip to the minus 1, the inverse operation. That's encryption, and the result will be 8 bits of ciphertext. I will go through and explain what each block does. This is just the algorithm at a high level. Decryption is the same. We see, but we start with the ciphertext. Initial permutation, same function. Swap the halves, same function, f of k, inverse initial permutation. It's the same as encryption. Okay, the same steps. Except we use the keys in the opposite order. Here we use k1 and then k2. In the decryption, we'll use K2 and then K1. So this is the concept in DES as well. Decryption is the same steps as encryption. So you just need one piece of code, one piece of hardware to implement that. 
we have a 10-bit key as an input. Where do we go? 10-bit key as an input, one key. In each round, we use what's called a round key or a sub key. K1 and K2 are round keys. We need to generate them. So there's a, an algorithm that we use at the start to generate the keys. So we start with our 10-bit key and apply some steps and we'll produce K1 and K2 as an output. Then we'll use them to encrypt. We'll use the same values to decrypt. And those, the algorithm to generate the key, the keys, P is a permutation. So P stands for permutation, transposition, rearrangement. P10 will define what the exact permutation is. A shift, we'll see it's a left shift of our bits. Another permutation, another shift, and another permutation. We'll define those steps in our example. Let's go to our example. This one. the same one I've got. Yep. So we have some plain text that we want to encrypt. The user has a key, a 10 bit key. We're going to encrypt that plain text with a key and everything. If we go correct in the example, we should get that ciphertext as an output. So I'll show you the operations using this example. What do we do first? I want to encrypt the plain text. What am I going to do? Again? Split them up, you're too far ahead. What do I need first? Well, actually you could, but the first thing we need to do in fact is to generate the keys. So I think before we encrypt, we do this middle part, which is the key generation. We have one key, we're going to need K1 and K2. The key generation algorithm, these steps, is the same at both encrypt and decrypt. So let's go through the first step of key generation. And it's a bit more detail here. How to read this diagram is that, all right, we have a 10-bit key. This, this line, this arrow with the, the slash and the 10 means the number of bits that are passed along that, that, uh, uh, along that arrow. We start with 10 bits, we apply a permutation, P10. That is, we rearrange those 10 bits. The rearrangement is fixed. Whenever we have some 10 bits, we always rearrange them in the same way, according to P10. What is P10? What is that rearrangement is defined here. This is P10. The way to read that is that we have 10 bits on input, the first bit becomes the seventh bit. The second bit becomes the third bit. The third bit of our input becomes the first bit of our output. So that's how to read this diagram, the permutation. So it tells us when we have 10 bits of input how to rearrange those 10 bits. And that's fixed for the algorithm. The attacker knows that, so everyone knows that. And it's always the same. And the same in, in real deaths. There's a permutation. It's much bigger. It's not on 10 bits. Uh, it's much bigger. And, but again, it's defined and fixed, publicly known. Similar, we'll see some other permutations, P8 and P4. 
So let's do it. P10. So we take our key and apply permutation to P10. And we'll do it slowly at the start. And I need it so I can remember. The definition of P10 is take the third bit becomes the first bit. So this is P10 we're doing here, just to make it clear. So the third bit becomes the first bit. The fifth bit becomes the second bit. Bit 5. And then we have the second bit. Bit 2. Bit 7, which is here. Bit 4, 10, 1, 9, 8, and 6. 9, 8, and 6. So let's just rearrange those bits. Any questions on that? Because we'll use the same concept in other permutations and I won't go through it in all the detail. So the output of the P10 operation is the 10 bits 1000001100. Zero, 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 one, one, zero, zero. Nothing complex about that. Just make sure you understand the notation we use in the, uh, on the slides. OK, easy. Not easy. Why? Rearrange 10 bits. It's one of the easiest things you'll get in this course. <laughs> The, the ordering is told to you, that is, in the exam, I would give you this information, P10, so that's given. You don't have to remember the exact rearrangement. It's defined as part of the algorithm. It's a transposition. Similar to the rows column cipher, the rail fence cipher, they just rearrange the letters. This is just rearranging the bits. Of course, on its own, there's no security value in it. Because on its own, if the attacker has this, and they know the arrangement, they can easily get this. But we'll see as we go through, as we apply multiple transpositions and substitutions, it should be hard for the attacker to work out, given the ciphertext, what the plaintext or key is. So let's keep going. What's the time? We'll go through for another 20 minutes or so this example and then we won't get through the end and then I, at the end I'll give it another example on our steganography. See how far we can go. That's P10. This step. And now we split it into two halves. The left and the right half. So we're going to operate on each half and we'll do a left shift by one position. LS means left shift. So a, a simple, you've seen these in computer hardware courses and so on. We just shift all the bits to the left by one position. Of course, the leftmost bit wraps around and becomes the rightmost bit. Yeah. Try it. But do it on five bits at a time. That is, do a left shift on these five bits and then do a left shift on these five bits separately.
So this was P10. Now we're doing left shift. What's the first? What do we get? So the second bit becomes the first bit. So it's just this. And the leftmost bit becomes, wraps around to the rightmost bit. Everything shifted left. Okay? But no, you do it on the two halves separately. Then do it on the second half, the right half. It becomes one, one, zero, zero, and that becomes at the end, zero. Okay. And then we join them together again. We've got the 10 bits back together and apply P8. P8 is a, both a permutation and a selection. Note there are 10 bits in, 5 plus 5, 10 bits in, 8 bits come out. So 10 bits come in, 8 bits come out. We rearrange and discard 2 bits. And it's defined here. 10 bits in, the 8 bits out, we get rid of bit 1 and 2. So apply P8 on these 10 bits, what do we get? We get bit 6, 3, 7, 4, 6, 3, 7, 4, 8, 5, 10, 9. 8 is 0, 5 is 1, 10 is 0, and 9 is 0. So that's P8 being applied. We rearranged those bits, but only 8 of them. Bits 1 and 2 we discarded. And now we have K. K1, the round key for round one, or the sub key K1. That's the output here. So this is, this value is K1. We'll use that later when we encrypt and also use it when we decrypt. The next step, if we go back up a bit, the output of our left shift, those 10 bits, we perform another left shift on each half. LS2 means a left shift by two bits, two positions. So take this five bits again and do a two bit left shift. And same with the right half. So this was LS1 and now do it LS2 on these and see what you get. And to finish, do P8 again. Tell me what you get. Do P8 and you'll get the K2, the second round key. Yep. Yeah, LS2 we apply on the we, this, this we're finished with. We don't use this again. It's K2, K1. We see here, we take the output of the LS1 and input it into LS2. And same with the right-hand side. 
That is, take these five bits and do a left shift by two positions. And shift everything left and we get 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. Let's just make this clear. And then apply P8 on those 10 bits and you'll get the final result. So the last 10 bits we apply P8 again, we'll get rid of bits 1 and 2 and rearrange the, the other 8 bits and the result is K, K2, the second round key. You can try it and then we'll check our answers. Okay. And I'll just uh, to make some space and I clean these off. So P10 rearrange the first 10 bits a left shift on each of the halves and then P8 gave us K1 and then going back to these 10 bits we apply a second left shift by two positions and then P8 gives us the K2. This is P8 here. So let's record K1 and K2. The round keys. We've just done the middle part, these steps. We now need to encrypt our plain text. With our encryption, we take our 8 bit plain text apply some permutation. Again, that's defined. IP is just another rearrangement shown here. It's an initial permutation. We just do it at the start and we do an inverse at the end. And then we apply some function f of k. So let's first do the initial permutation and then describe the function. Take our plain text 0, 1, 1, 1 0, 1, is that? there's our plain text. Apply IP, the initial permutation. We get the second bit, bit 2, bit 6, bit 3, bit 1, so reading through here, bit 4, 8, 5 and 7. 4, 8, 5 and 7. That was applying IP from our plain text. That was this step. 8 bits in, 8 bits out. In fact, we have a more detailed 
description here. This is the detailed encryption algorithm. It shows us the, the function f of k. This dark grey box on the, the larger dark grey box is f of k, a function that takes a key as an input. Takes 8 bits in, takes a key as input, and produces 8 bits out here. Then we'll do swap the halves, and then we'll apply the same function, take 8 bits in, k2 as an input, and we'll get 8 bits out, and then we'll do the inverse initial permutation and get the ciphertext. So we've just done IP at the top, now we need to go into the details of this function. We see it involves multiple steps. Let's describe them. The first step, again, we, as in the FISAL structure, we operate on the left and the right half separately. So we split our input into two halves. And you see here, the left half, follow this line, four bits, the left half is not used until the end. We do all of this on the right half. So the rightmost four bits. We take the right four bits, EP, expand and permutate. We take four bits in, we're going to get eight bits out. Permutate, we'll rearrange as well. We'll define, it's defined on the previous slides. Then we'll take those eight bits and exclusive all with the key, K1, which we just calculated, the round key. Then we'll take each half, so we have eight bits, so four bits at a time, and apply an S box. And this is not an X box, an S box. <laughs> S stands for what? X. S stands for what? <laughs> substitution box. This is our complex substitution. S box. No, this S0 and S1. Here. P is permutation or transposition. We've called it transposi transposition in the classical ciphers. So, two main operations in ciphers rearrange, P, permutation, or substitute, which are the S boxes here. In fact, an XOR also does a substitution. But we'll see that the S boxes are the comple complexity the nonlinear substitution. So we'll describe them. We'll take the outputs, a permutation, XOR with the left half, take 8 bits, swap, do it all again. Do an inverse initial permutation and we get our ciphertext. Let's just get started on this block in here. So we take four bits. We're just going to operate on the right half now. That's, we're at this point, the four bits here. And we're going to go into this light gray box here where we first expand and permutate. It's defined here. We take four bits in, bit one, two, three, four, and we get eight bits out. Bits four, one, two, three, and bits 2, 3, 4, 1. We took 4 bits and we get 8 bits out using the EP operation. That's this. We repeat, we repeat the bits 2 times and reorder them. Any problems so far? Always an exam question, encrypt this with simplified deaths or even quiz questions. Next. Exclusive all with K2. So we've got 8 bits. Exclusive all with K2. Sorry, K1. K1. X all with 1010. Zero one zero zero. 
this was our input. This is K2, K1. Why am I confused? We're going to XOR. What's the answer? So perform the XOR. What's one XOR one? Huh? You've got two two choices. It's not one. Exclusive or one XOR one is zero. One XOR zero one one. Did I get that correct? Zero and one gives us one. The, the others gives us zero. So a simple exclusive or. And we're now about to start our S box. We split that into two halves again, two four-bit values, and we feed the left half into what's called S box zero, S zero, and the right half into S box S one. What are the S boxes? Well, we're going to substitute some values with other values, and they are defined where? They are defined here. So let's con first consider the left half. The input is 0, 1, 1, 0. And the input to S box S0. There are two S boxes. So we first take the left half, 0, 1, 1, 0. And it's an input to this first S box S0. The way to read this, we can think of it as a matrix where we have 4-bit input. Bits 1 and 4 specify the row. And bits 2 and 3, the middle two bits, specify the column and simply look up the matrix and we get the output value. We'll have 4 bits in, we'll get 2 bits out. We substitute some 4 bits with 2 bits. Note that, of course, remember the index into a in the array, in the array we start into the matrix we start with row 0, 1, 2 and 3. We're using decimal, uh, sorry, we're using binary so uh, if we use these values to determine an index in the matrix then bit 1 and 4 in our case bits, bit 1, bit 4 tells us the row our case, 0, 0. And bit 2 and bit 3 tells us the column, 1, 1. In decimal, row 0, column 3, assuming our index starts at 0. What's the output? Row 0, no, so be careful. Row 0, 1, 2, 3, column 0, 1, 2, 3. Now just look up. Row 0, column 3, output is 1, 0. And so so get, be careful with the indexes here. Our index start with zeros. The index to the matrix starts with 0. 0, 1, 2, 3. Not 1, 2, 3, 4, because with 2 bits we cannot get the value 4. And then on the right half we had over here, 0, 1, 1, 1, we apply that on S box S1. So try that. So what we just did was for the left half here, on S0 and take the right half and input into S1. Try that. 
try it. So take those four bits and use them as the the indexes for or the index to find the element of S1. And the output we get we get row zero one column one one the middle two bits and simply look up row row zero zero row zero one column one one is here one one is the output. So that's how we use the S boxes. And these are a substitution and an important part of the algorithm. Note that if you look at the values, they're designed in a way such that it's hard to go backwards to, given, the, given one of these values, tell us what the input was. Okay. So given if I give you 1, 1, what was the input? Well, it can be many possible values. So going backwards, there's no way to find the exact value, the correct value going backwards. If you knew that the output was 1, 1, the input could have been for this value, this value, this one, or this one. Okay? So that's one of the features of the S box. I think what we'll do in the last 10 minutes, we'll try and finish this first round and then we'll leave it uh, till next week to show the steganography example. Where are we going? Where are we? We are here. Two bits as the output of each of the S boxes. Okay. And now you need to do P4. Try it. We have four bits. One zero, one one. We took the two bits from S zero, the two bits from S one, and now apply P four. P four is defined for us somewhere. Two four three one. Two, four, three, one. We get our output. We're now here. After applying P4, we get four bits. And now we take the left side from IP, which I just removed. What's the left side of IP? The left side of output of the initial permutation. When we did the initial permutation at the start, I had it up there, I removed it. We took the right side and now we take the left four bits from the, from the output of the initial permutation and XOR with these four bits. What were they? The output of IP was? 1010. This is the left bits out of IP. So 
when you calculated the initial or performed the initial permutation, you got eight bits out. These are left four bits. XOR. And we're now here. And the right bits out of IP, hmm? the right bits, 1001. So the output of IP, we take the right bits and bring them to here. So we have, let's say, 1101 at this point plus the right bits from the output of IP, which is what, 1010? Again. <laughs> One more time. 1001. This is the left, the right bits. out of IP. That is, we did P4, we took the left bits from IP, XOR, and then combined with the right bits out of IP, and we are here. We're at the end of F of K, our function. We swap the halves. Swap these two. So we end up So again, we have one one zero one one zero zero one and now swap the halves. And we now start round two. We do exactly the same from what's in the dark grey box at the top. We apply the same steps, but we just have a different input here. And the only difference is that we use K2. But the operations are the same. And you will do that and find out that the output here, you'll apply f of k and you'll get so from this point we have these eight bits. We apply f of k, the, the lowercase f with a k, k2. And the output of that here is 1101101. Then there's one last thing to do, and it's the inverse initial permutation. In the exam, you may see from last past year exams, then I've given you, for example, the, the pictures of the algorithm and the permutations, and it's simply encrypt this, decrypt this. Usually it's not the whole step. It may be, for example, here's the input to this block. Tell me the output or the ciphertext. Takes you 10 minutes. Doesn't take long. No. You'll see from past exams. But I think recently I haven't given long questions on this. So in fact, each individual operation is quite simple. Permutate, and the permutations are defined. And a substitution, well, two things. There's XORs and there's the S boxes. But again, quite simple on their own. Combined, 
without doing a brute force attack, if you have the cipher text, you will find it very hard to get the plain text to go backwards if you don't have the key. And so the algorithm itself is quite secure. Any questions on those steps? We're not going to go through the second round yet. Yeah? How do we do the inverse? Okay, how do you do the inverse permutation? That will be your homework. Work out the inverse permutation. What do we mean by the inverse? Oh, here it is. It's the inverse of IP. You work it out. And because I've given you the, this is the input to the inverse, and the answer, the ciphertext, is on the slides. You should get this as the output. So try and work out what do we mean by the inverse of permutation. So try and work that out, that one. Any other questions on the individual steps? Sorry? Isn't this susceptible to For sure. Simplified DES, we can do a brute force. But simplified DES is simple for teaching. Real DES, 56-bit key, also susceptible to brute force. But it's no longer used. Because the same concepts are used in other ciphers. We will see, we'll look at the advantages and disadvantages of real DES next week. So next week what we'll do is summarise on simplified DES and more importantly compare with real DES and see the, uh, the similarities. Five minutes, one last example. Here's a flag, a picture, a JPEG. Okay, we've got a picture. I want to apply steganography and so the, the concept or the idea is I'm going to send someone uh, this picture and it, hidden inside the picture is going to be a message that's steganography and I've got some software that will do it. it's very simple it's not that uh, efficient the program is so I want a message uh, So we have our secret message. And I'm going to save that in a file. So this is what I do as the sender. Okay, I, take, I create my message, save it in a file. What it, whatever we want to call it, my message. So we have our message in a file. And then we use some program. The idea is to take a JPEG and a JPEG is, or an image, is a set of pixels. And each pixel, each, each dot there, is represented by some number, some integer, so, so, or some binary value. And the idea is that what we can do in the structure of the JPEG file is change some of the bits. It may possibly change some of the pixels, the exact values, but from what you see, you will not notice any change. So change some of the bits such that we use those bits to carry the message. Because our message, if we convert using ASCII, we can convert to binary. My message is in binary. And those bits are then encoded inside the, the JPEG image. So I have a program that will do it for us called OutGuess. There are others that do it. It takes as the input the message takes my picture and produces another picture as the output, a, a second JPEG. It gives some statistics, we're not explained, but it shows some statistics about the bits that have been changed in there, 118 bits changed. Uh, and it's created an image. 
and then I take that second image and send it to someone. Okay, so I take the second image and I send that to you and this is what you see. So you receive this and when you look at it, I'll just... What's the difference? So this is the first image and the second image. Okay, there's no difference in fact in this case. In this case, because I think we have some extra bits that in a JPEG you can change some bits and not even change the, any of the pixels because there's some extra information that we can change. So we can encode, depending upon the length of your message, if you had a longer message, there may be some pixels that change. But again, it would be very hard to notice. So we send the second message across the internet. Someone may intercept it, but all they see is a picture. They don't know that it carries a hidden message. Except the person who receives it knows that it carries a hidden message and they use the software to take the received picture, the second JPEG, so we take the received picture and, and put the message into some file and it gives some statistics and if we look at the file we, we get the message out. So the receiver has an image only and this program decodes or extracts the hidden message from that image and puts it into a file, receive.txt, and it's of course the same message. Sorry? Don't you need the original file? No. No. From I create, I take the original image, I, en I encode the message in that original me image, and I get a second image. Okay, it's different. The binary, the, the, the bits are different. But from the, when I send that, from the view of someone looking at it, they cannot see the difference. You cannot perceive any uh, bit changes. But in fact, the bits are different. The bits contain the, the message that was encoded. So the receiver gets the received message, decodes, and gets the hidden message out. That assumes that, of course, we can use that image uh, and change some of the bits without someone noticing. So long as your message is small, you can do that. If the message was a, a 10, 10 kilobyte document, it would be much harder to do that. You may see the changes in, in the image. So that's a quick example of steganography. There's a link to that example, so you can see the code, you can see the program on the course website. You'll find a link to that example. Okay. Let's continue next week.